talk about crops and temperature extremes, and in particular, I'm going to do a, a more narrow view on that and really talk about corn and heat waves. Um, from the perspective of adaptation, uh, whether or not we should expect heat waves to get hotter, and then medium term forecasting of heat waves. This is work that I've done with Ethan Butler, Marina Lynn, Karen McKinnon, Nathan Mueller, and Andy Rines. Um, so here, for better or worse, is how average yield of corn in the U.S. has changed since 1965. It's roughly doubled. But what I'm going to be talking about is this variability around the trend. And here we have, in that black line here, the detrended yield. You can see that during 2012, which we've already heard about, when we had heat wave and drought, we had a reduction in total yields, about 20% less than usual. Uh, we saw the same thing in 1988. Now, what I've superimposed on this black detrended yield curve is an indication of high temperatures. Okay? This is really the cumulative sum of temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius day by day during the growing season, year by year. And what you can see is there's a good correspondence between the two. In fact, this index of high temperatures uh, explains more than 60% of the variance in the anomalies in yield. Okay? So you have a strong coupling between temperature and temperature also in often involves moisture availability. Uh, and yield, how many bushels per hectare can be generated. And what people have often done is to take the sensitivity that can be diagnosed from this, this sort of analysis and say, okay, well, when we go into the future, we have a long-term warming, how much loss of yield are we going to have? And that makes some sense, but it doesn't account for the fact that we can adapt through time. And so if we want a more resolved view of how changes in temperature might influence food production, we'd also want some sort of measure of adaptation. And here in this more resolved plot is one way of getting at that. And what I'm showing here in color is sensitivity of yield to changes in these hot temperatures, calling them killing degree days. And you can see there's a gradient going here from the northeast to the southwest where you have lower sensitivities. Now the contours are showing the climatology of these killing degree days, how often it's really hot in a given place. And you can see that this too has a gradient where we have obviously hotter temperatures here towards the south and somewhat to the west. Now this extant patterns can be used to infer what adaptation has been. Right? These are the mean climatologies and what we're growing in these various places and how we're doing it. And you can use this as a proxy then for the amount of adaptation that we might be able to expect going forward. And if one does that, it has big consequences. So taking a, a simple scenario, we say a mean warming of two degrees Celsius, if we had no adaptation, we would infer a 14% loss in yields. But if we do adapt according to our model fit here to the spatial variability, you only get a 4% decline. Now, I wouldn't take these numbers seriously, but I would take the fact that adaptation plays a big role in the damages that you might expect uh, as something that's quite robust and something that should be accounted for in any type of assessment of what's likely to be the consequence of climate change. Okay, so that's point one. Now, briefly, point two. Let's look at how temperatures actually have been changing. And this is over the last century, uh, and with particular date intervals chosen according to when good census data is available. And what we are looking at in particular is the hottest temperatures during the growing season. This is the 95th percentile of temperature. And what we see is it's warming over most of the US. But here, right in the midst of the Corn Belt, what we actually have is cooling. And it's fairly substantial. These hottest temperatures have decreased on average by about 2 degrees Celsius. Okay, now, if we want to know how, is changes in how are changes in temperature going to influence production going into the future, we'd want to know of whether or not these kind of fortuitous cooling pattern in this particular location is likely to persist, for which we need a mechanism. We've assessed a number of different possible mechanisms, and the one that really seems the most viable is this notion that through incre increased agricultural intensity, we actually have greater capacity for evapotranspiration in the Corn Belt. Okay. In particular, what's happening on the very hottest days, we're seeing greater cooling because of evapotranspiration, evaporative cooling. And the crops themselves are changing the climate in a way that is beneficial for growing crops. That's shown over here, this metric of agricultural intensity in terms of net primary production. So we move to the right, higher increases in net primary product production. And we can see this change in hot temperatures getting greater and greater cooling as we move off to the right. Star is indicating statistical significance. Okay. So we might expect that this pattern will persist to some degree 
going forward in so much as we have w available water. Okay, and that, that's a big caveat. Uh, a lot of additional things to think about there. Okay, one final point. Okay, we've also been looking at can we predict heat waves? And this is on a time scale of weeks and months now, not centuries. And here's a typical pattern uh, when we have a heat wave during the growing season in the eastern US. The closed contours indicate high pressure, which is accompanies high temperatures. And it so happens that when we have heat waves in the eastern US, they are typically associated with a sea surface temperature pattern that exists over in the mid-latitude Pacific. And this pattern is one of a tripole where we have cool, warm, cool. Now, there's not an instantaneous link between what's going on here and here, but if we go back five days, in an average sense, relative to when a heat wave occurs. What we can see is that these pressure anomalies exist across this entire strip here, where we have negative pressure anomalies in the dash, positive, negative, positive, and so this is like a wave train. And what we're actually seeing in the red arrows is the activity of waves propagating directly from the mid-latitudes over the Pacific over to the eastern U.S., aiding in the development of this high pressure that is associated with the heat wave that eventually occurs. Now, what turns out to be quite nice is if we look at these sea surface temperature patterns, they evolve through time. If we go back 10 days, we have uh, a situation where it's more of a dipole in the north-south and less of a tripole in the east-west. And if we go back as much as 40 days, we can see the evolution of this pattern taking place in a fairly consistent and predictable fashion. We can use that as an index for predicting heat waves. And this will be the last thing that I show you. What I'm plotting here is an odds ratio. And what it's showing is that 40 days prior to a heat wave, depending on the expression of this pattern in the mid-latitude Pacific, we can have odds of a heat wave that are greater than twice climatology, or if we have the negative phase of this pattern in the Pacific, less than half of what is typical uh, for one standard deviations in this pattern index. Now, this is only 40 days. That's not going to be quite early enough to decide what you're going to plant. But we think through ocean forecasting and other possibilities, maybe we can extend it even further such that farmers would have more advanced notice of what's likely to occur. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you.